All right, good morning. Good to morning. be back. I hope you're glad to, to be back as well. <laughs> uh, we're going through the life of uh, Joseph. And the last we, uh, we saw of Joseph last week, he was interpreting dreams uh, uh, for the cupbearer and the baker, who evidently were in prison because they had plotted against him in, in some fashion. Uh, now, we mentioned also that the, the cupbearer role was very important to, to Pharaoh. Uh, he's the person who tasted all the wine and the food uh, before the king ate or drank anything. So if something was poison, goodbye cupbearer. Okay, and Pharaoh, long live Pharaoh. He also would uh, would not allow poorly prepared food to get to Pharaoh. So he was in charge of watching his diet as well. So they have a very close relationship and a relationship of trust between the two men. Uh, and of course, the cupbearer and baker both had dreams. Uh, while in prison on the same night. Uh, and it, it's interesting, in Scripture it says that Joseph, while he's in prison, he was put in charge of all the prisoners, but it says Joseph served them. And we brought up the point that Joseph had a servant's heart, much like Jesus. I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. And so Joseph sees the sad faces on them, he asks them why they're sad, and he relates the dreams that they had, uh, and there's no one there to interpret it for him. And Joseph says then, do not interpretations belong to God. Remember that. That's what he said to the cupbearer and the baker. And he said, tell me your dreams. So Joseph interprets the dreams for him. And the cupbearer will be restored in three days. That's good, happy news. Everybody loves to give that news. Unfortunately, the baker is going to be killed in three days. And Joseph delivered that message. That's, those are God's words to them, straightforward, without any intervention, without any softening of anything. You know, I think we tend to do that sometimes. We want to soften what God's word says, uh, but that's not really a good, a good advice. You know, there's a desire for us to, to soften God's word to make it easier to accept. As John MacArthur said, we've watered down the gospel so much that the non-elect won't reject it. And that's really true. You know, instead of calling sin, sin, we use words like, Struggles, failures, mistakes, baggage, issues. Anybody got any of those? I got all those. Hang ups, problems, challenges, and sin. We don't like to call sin anymore. There is a movement to get the word sin removed from the dictionary. Nobody <laughs> wants to hear the word sin. Why is that? It's convicting because everybody knows what sin is. And you know whether you're in sin or not in sin. But you don't want to be confronted with your sin. You know, like I said, it's, it's not uncommon for people to speak about matters that violate the teaching of the Bible in such a way that the transgressions don't sound so bad. That is a prime ploy of the devil. It's watered down God's words so much you can't even recognize it. That people won't even be convicted of their sins. So what's the problem with not confronting sin straightforward? First of all, we're commanded to hold each other accountable. God sharpens one iron, one man sharpens another. That's a proper word. Yeah. Jesus tells us we're supposed to do this. It's all over the place. Okay. What else? What else might be a problem with that? Ken? No need for a redeemer. No need for a redeemer. I think the big thing for me is it makes it easier to sin. If <clears throat> God's word, if you're confronting someone, is not is not having an effect on them, if it's not convicting to them, then you might as well just keep doing it. And that's the problem with trying to water down. You know, we use, we tend to use politically correct words instead of biblical words now. Lynn. It's like the riot and looting that's going on now. Oh no, that's protesting, Lynn. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. That's right. I've been mistreated my whole life, so I have the right to steal from Target and loot the, uh, yeah. the store. But we do that. Politically correct terms. Political correctness is ruining this country. And I think that's part of the reason why we don't confront sin anymore is because we don't want to offend anybody. You know, and I'm not looking to offend people, but at the same time, I'm not looking to lie to them either. You know, we use, you know, adultery and fornication is now free love, sexually active. Safe sex, you use these terms all the time. And it's described as between consenting adults, except when it's not. 
We talk about alternative lifestyles, sexual preferences. Uh, partners are now significant others. You know, an abortion on demand is pro-choice. Women's health care. It's can you believe that they call that a health care right? Give me a break. Yeah, that's but Joseph didn't do that. Just like Spurgeon said, you know, it's so easy to do the sermon on the cupbearer, but you don't want to do the sermon on the baker. But Joseph doesn't do that. God gave him straightforward, here's what the dreams mean, and relay that. And that's exactly what Joseph did. So we're going to pick up in uh, chapter 41. We're going to start with verses 1 through 8. So Mike, hit it. When two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing by the Nile when out of the river there came seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows, ugly and gaunt, came up out of the Nile and stood beside those on the riverbank. And the cows that were ugly and gaunt ate up the seven sleek, fat cows. Then Pharaoh woke up. He fell asleep again and had a second dream. Seven heads of grain, healthy and good, were growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads of grain sprouted, thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin hey, heads of grain swallowed up the seven healthy, full heads. Then Pharaoh woke up. It had been a dream. In the morning, his mind was troubled. So he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret them for him. Hey, Mike, are you on an iPad? No. Uh, Okay. Laptop. Okay. When you're talking just now, it's real loud. When you get your head turned down, we can barely hear you. Oh, got it. Okay. I'll get a little closer. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So let me paraphrase that section for you. Uh, so first of all, it happened at the end of two full years. Okay. The Pharaoh had this dream, and he's standing by the Nile, and he sees these. He's had this dream about the seven cows that are sleek and fat and they've grazed in the marshland. And then there were seven cows that came up from the Nile. They're ugly and they're devouring the, the other cows by the bank. Okay. And it says that he woke, he awoke and then he fell asleep again. He has the same dream two times. So he awoke, he's got this dream that's troubling to him and then he falls asleep again and he has a very similar dream, which we'll get into here in just a second. Now, in the morning, it says his spirit was troubled, so he sent and called for the magicians of Egypt. Now, Joseph has been in prison for two full years since the cupbearer got out, okay? And he has these dreams. As noted, uh, there's a significance when you have the same dream twice, or you have back-to-back -back dreams, or in the case of the cupbearer and the baker, they each had a dream but they had similar meanings. Those dreams are so rich in detail. Um, and the symbolism is, uh, it's hard to imagine for me when it says that Pharaoh gathered together the magicians, um, which by the way, um, magicians here, the word originally uh, translated from ancient Hebrew to Greek, the translators use the word men versed in sacred writings. These are not dumb people, okay? So they use magicians, but don't think about, you know, Siegfried and Roy, okay? This is, we're talking about very wise men, the learned men, and the symbolism is pretty clear, at least in Joseph's eye, they're very clear what it is. Now, why do I mention that? Because deciphering, these magicians would decipher just about anything from hieroglyphic text to the movement of the stars, but they lacked one thing. What did they lack? God wasn't speaking to him. So you can read all you want and you can decipher all you want, but if you don't have God uh, in your life, they're not going to get the answer. I kind of admire the magicians for telling Pharaoh, we don't know. They could have made something up, okay, but given the what the cupbearer and baker went through with Pharaoh, yeah, if you were wrong, Pharaoh might have got upset about that. So he didn't have, they didn't, God didn't give them the knowledge that he gave, uh, that he gave Joseph. Let's, uh, let's read on here. Mike, uh, verses 9 to 14. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, 
Today I am reminded of my shortcomings. Pharaoh was once angry with his servants, and he imprisoned me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream. And things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position, and the other man was hanged. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. So after two years, the cupbearer tells Pharaoh, I know a guy. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Two years. Now, I first read this a little, little ticked off. Now, the scripture says he forgot. I know a guy. Okay. And I got, I thought about this for a long time. I finally had to go to my wife, you know, the, the smart one of the family. I said, why, why do you think that? You, do you think he waited just for opportunity? Here's an opportunity for me to look really good in Pharaoh's eyes. Did he really just forget? And then Patsy told me, she says, well, maybe he was waiting because he just got restored to Pharaoh, and he's probably reestablishing trust and everything. He probably didn't feel comfortable making any suggestions to Pharaoh until this point. So the opportunity does present itself, and then he finally remembers that he knows a guy. John? Yes? Uh, also, the great possibility is that God was in it, and he actually called him. Oh, it could be. Yeah, I'm going to take scripture at its word. It says he forgot. And so I'm just, just going to leave it at that. But it does kind of, it did, did make me, uh, my suspicious mind wonder, well, that was pretty convenient that you remembered when Pharaoh's got a problem. So now, remember, Joseph knows nothing about this. This is all taking place in Pharaoh's palace. He has no idea what's coming. You know, he's back there in the dungeon. You know, suddenly chains are rattling and doors are opening and you know he's being pulled out of the pit he has no idea why so pharaoh was immediately amiable to the cupbearer's suggestion and i think that speaks volumes for pharaoh how distraught he was these dreams must have been very disturbing to him that he was willing to take the cupbearer's advice and bank on a guy that he doesn't even know And it says they shaved him and clothed him and brought him to Pharaoh. Why do you think they, they shaved him? I think they try to make him look like Yul Brenner myself. And, um, <laughs> have you ever noticed that every, every movie where Pharaoh is depicted, it looks just like that? It's Yul Brenner. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You got to clean up. I, I, Dennis Prager says, I think they wanted to make him look a little more Egyptian. Okay, and clean shave was, was one of the things there, which is interesting when I'm trying to find pictures and, and, and graphics for, for slides. They've all got him with a beard and full hair. And they, but the chances are they probably probably shaved his head and shaved his face, and he was, he was, uh, he was cleaned up to go before Pharaoh. Lynn? Yeah, it was very common and, and really almost demanded that Israelite men in that they wore their Yeah. His shaving would have been, a, in some respects, a violation of his faith. Yet, by the same time, he was in captivity. And yeah. So he became almost a, uh, because he would have had to have shaved in Potiphar's house, too. So he almost became a, a play actor yeah. uh, kind of in front of the Egyptians. And, and so he saw favor of the Egyptians, and they. Uh, effectively elevated. Well, I remember you're coming out of prison. I don't think you got a lot to, a lot to say here. You know, oh, hey, don't shave my beard. You know, it's a religious thing. He ain't doing that. He's happy to be out and he doesn't know why he's getting out. So when they clean him up and shave him, I, I just wonder what's going through his mind at that point. But I do think that he was probably, they were trying to make him look less Hebrew and more Egyptian like and, and cleaning him up. Let's move on. Verses uh, 15 and 16, Mike. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one can interpret it, but I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Now, 
you know, there's, again, it, if you spent two years in prison, you don't know what's going through the cupbearer's mind. All you know is he's forgotten you. You know, Pharaoh is coming to him, basically looking for a favor. I've heard you have this ability. Can you, can you help me out here? And, you know, Joseph could have said, you know, hey, hey wait a second. You know, I don't have the answer, but God does. Um, but you know what? If you take care of that cupbearer, I'll be happy to do this favor for you. You know, he could have called in that. You know, you expect me to help you now? I've been rotten in this prison for two years when I told your cupbearer. He saw exactly what happened. But, that, but Joseph doesn't do that. Joseph doesn't do that. I'm not the one with the answers. I serve a God who does have the answers. I think a lot of us probably would have looked for the opportunity to maybe, uh, you know, stick it to the cupbearer just a little bit. But he doesn't. He tells him, he says, we will listen to him and he will tell us what to learn there. He told the magicians. This is interesting. There was no one that could explain it to him. You know, in fact, he's saying, Pharaoh, there's a God behind those stars that your magicians and soothsayers are gazing at and they have no relationship with him. And I'm here to tell you that he and he alone is the one who handles dreams. You know, and then what happens, he literally says, God will give Pharaoh peace. Isn't that great? That's the literal translation. God will give Pharaoh peace. Pharaoh, God will bring shalom to you. He will give a peaceful answer, and it's from God, and it'll be right. That had, those words alone had to be comforting to, to Pharaoh. And as he said to the cupbearer and the baker, he said, it's, it's not me, it's God. And then also in front of Pharaoh, he uses the, the word again, Elohim, for God. That's kind of a universal description of God. So he used that deliberately so that Pharaoh would at least understand what he was talking about. So he, Pharaoh tells him the dream. Now, it's kind of a long section here. Um, let's go. Hey, Mike, let's read the 25 to 32. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads of grain are seven years. It is one and the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that came up afterward are seven years, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind. They are seven years of famine. It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt. The seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God. And God will do it soon. All right, let's, and let's now let Pharaoh let's stop let's right there. there Mike. Hey, Mike, hang on right there. That, that mic is getting worse, uh, <laughs> Bart. Um, so he tells Pharaoh, he comes before Pharaoh and he tells him about the two dreams. And then he immediately tells him, those two dreams are the same. You, uh, okay, you're going to go out that way, Mark? He tells him the dreams are exactly the same. And then he tells him, uh, you know, you're going to have seven years of abundance. You're going to have seven years of famine. And the first part of this section is him just interpreting the dream. He's telling him what it is. Seven years of, of great harvest coming up, seven years of famine after that. Then he also says, and God will bring it about quickly. So he's telling him, you don't have time to mess around with this. You've got seven good years coming ahead of you, and you've got seven awful years coming behind it. And he's going to do it quickly. Now, the second part of that uh, thing, he he's starts offering some advice. So the first part up to now, up to verse 32, he's just interpreting the dreams and telling them what they mean. Now, the second part is, and this is the difference between knowledge and wisdom, uh, he starts to give him some suggestions of what he should do. Bart, are you out there? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Um, Sorry, Mike, your, your microphone was a little rough, so uh, I sent Bart into another part of the building. 
<laughs> Bart, uh, if you can read uh, 33 to 36. <laughs> yeah, he's back home by his pool. <laughs> All right. And yeah. now let 33 to 36. And now yeah. let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of those good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so the country may not be ruined by the famine. So here he's giving them advice. Now, notice one thing. I noticed the, the first time uh, when he's doing the interpretation for the cupbearer and the baker, his response is immediate. And say, you know what, let me go pray about this for a couple of days and I'll get back to you, Pharaoh, or cupbearer. No, he gives them the interpretation immediately. So clearly God is speaking to, to Joseph in a real-time manner. He knows either he's got such exceptional wisdom, but he's got God on his side as well. And so he gives, him, he gives him that. He outlines the actions that Pharaoh ought to take in order to prepare for the seven years of famine. And he says, uh, take a fifth. So basically, it's 20%. Usually in those days, Pharaoh would have taken a 10% of all your, uh, all your crops as a tax. So what, what he's suggesting here is a 20% tax. We need to collect 20% of everything for the next seven years so that we can survive that. And then he tells the Pharaoh, you know, that your dreams are one. Again, seven years of plenty and abundance and seven years of, of famine. Uh, you know, basically he says the famine will be so bad that the good years will be forgotten. That's how bad the famine is going to be. And again, the dreams repeated twice to Pharaoh. So again, this has some importance with it. And this is the key thing. It says God will bring it about quickly. This is about to start real soon. Not next year. You need to start right now. So he tells him you need a, a discerning and wise man. To this point, Joseph gave him knowledge. Telling him what would happen as revealed in the dreams. Now Joseph begins to apply some wisdom to that knowledge. It's good to remember the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge tells you what's going on. Wisdom tells you what to do about it. Knowledge is a diagnosis, and wisdom is directed to the cure. Knowledge is good and necessary, but it isn't enough. And I find in this day and age, we got a lot of knowledgeable people. But we don't always have a lot of wise people, people applying wisdom to their knowledge. You know, I know when I first became a Christian, I was, I was bent on knowledge. I felt like I was so far behind, I needed to educate myself with knowledge. But what I didn't have with that knowledge in those early years was any wisdom, any discernment, just knowledge, just knowledge. Really, you know, I just thought you could talk anybody into following Christ if you had enough knowledge. It doesn't work that way. So let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man. Let's say, Bart, let's uh, pick up the verse 38 to 46. Okay. So Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there's no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders, only with respect to the throne. Will I be greater than you? Where do you want me to stop? Um, 46? You go to 46. Okay. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen, put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command. And the people shouted before him, make way. Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one will lift hand or foot in all Egypt. And Pharaoh gave Joseph the name Zaphonath-Paneah, 
and gave him Azanah, daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, to be his wife. And Joseph went throughout the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from Pharaoh's presence and traveled throughout Egypt. Think about this. What, what amount of time do you think has passed from the time he heard the dungeon doors opening to drag him out of the pit to the time he's dressed in fine linen, got a gold chain, got the Pharaoh's signet ring on his hand? How much time do you think has passed? I, th I think it's a couple hours. I don't think it's much. They dragged him out. They cleaned him up and they stuck him before Pharaoh. I think it might be literally hours. You know, it's at this point that Joseph doesn't say anything. Here he just got done interpreting the dream for Pharaoh and he's given him all this wise advice and now he's quiet. I think he's dumbstruck. I think he's, he's thinking to himself, how can anyone but God have done what he's done to me in hours? Might have been a whole day, I, I don't know, but I didn't think it's hours, not days or, or weeks or anything like that. I think it was a very short period of time. You know, he's been, he was how old when he got uh, sold into slavery? 17. Now he's 30. He's been in prison a number of those years. He was on, in servitude all those years. And now he's the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. That's quite a journey. That's pretty heady stuff, even for a 30-year-old. You know, in his God-given wisdom, Joseph saw this great coming crisis needed proper administration. They're, they had a problem that needed to be understood, okay? And he's explained what the problem is. Uh, the goal and the vision to meet the goal, uh, goal had to be formulated. The right people had to be put in place. He had to understand the big vision and the role of it. Someone had to make sure that it was all operating according to plan. And the work had to be measured. God would use a man to put all that into place. It wouldn't happen like you would normally think a miracle happens. But in every sense of the word, it really is a miracle when you think about it. Think about where Joseph was 13 years ago to now he's the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. That feels miraculous to me. Now, it may not be meet the definition of a miracle, but very much so. And then I, I mentioned earlier, one-fifth means a 20% tax. Now, ancient sources suggest that Pharaoh normally would take 10%, going to do 20 to prepare for the famine that's coming. So he's basically doubled the taxes for seven years. What would a politician said, hey, this is coming, and uh, for the next seven years, we're going to double your taxes. So we can prepare for the bad times. Don, I know what you're thinking. Go ahead. <laughs> and, I, and I'm thankful of that. <laughs> but the seven years they talked about was an abundance. It was a far in excess of what the normal production would have been. That's right. So it was out of an excess. It wasn't out of uh, That's true. Living. That's a good point. God was going to bless them abundantly, and they're going to take more to store it away. Some verses that though is that you can take a fit only getting one full year of produce in five years. So seven years, you're going to get one point four. You have to, it has to be, like Don said. Seven years. That's right. It's going to be a sacrifice even during the accuracy, but not. That's right. You're not going to starve, okay, but you're not going to get fat either in the lean years, okay? Yeah, that's that's exactly true. This was the best picture I could find, and you can see uh, Joseph has got a full head of hair and a beard, and that probably didn't... Uh, happen like that. Now, Pharaoh had plenty of priests, magicians, holy men. What he did not have was a man with the Spirit of God. You notice that? This made Joseph stand apart from all the others. And this is the first mention in the Bible that the Holy Spirit came upon a man. It says that the Spirit of God was with him. And more importantly, Pharaoh noticed that. He noticed that he was a man of God. Why? Well, yeah, he interpreted his dreams. Well, why else? Well, I gave you the plan. I've outlined a plan how we're going to get through all this. The cupbearer has told him how he's interpreted dreams previously accurately. You can't come to any conclusion other than he was a godly man and God was with him. You know, it's interesting to note that 
It's in regard to the more practical things. Joseph didn't have to preach a sermon, lead a prayer session to see the spirit of God was upon him. Have you ever met people like that? That you just, you almost immediately know this is really a man of God? You know, I had a buddy, Tom Hahn, who was uh, in the master's men for a long time. And to me, nobody exuded the character of God more than Tom did. He loved the Lord. He had a passion for people who were unsaved. He, and he had a great ministry. The guy used to work out five days, a, five days a week in the gym. But the gym was not so much about working out, although Tom was a, a bodybuilder kind of guy. But the gym was his mission field. That's where he evangelized the people in the gym. People could see that he was a man of God. He would have people walk up to him, are you Tom? Uh, I'll tell you some, another time some stories about a guy who moved to Louisville and God told him, you need to find Tom. I'll tell you that another time. Len. John, it's interesting because uh, there are a lot of even Christians who have talent, but they're still lacking something. And, and what you're saying here is that it says uh, in Corinthians, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And, and then it goes on to say, those who think they know something, that's a lot of us. Those who think they know something do not do not have to know if they ought to know. But whoever loves God is known by God. And I think as you love God and gain that knowledge, he adds wisdom to it. But it comes from the love of God. I, I have to tell you, and I'd be curious to know how many people would agree with me. How many times have you heard Bob Russell speak and you and, and wonder, how did he know what I was thinking? Or how did he know? I'm just out of curiosity. How many how many people have ever heard that? I mean, that's because he is directed by, I think, the Holy Spirit. And, and, and essentially, the difference maker is really loving God, and then he endows you with wisdom. Yeah. And by the way, we need to add Bob Russell and Judy Russell to that. Yeah, they both have COVID. They have COVID. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, it reminds me of, you know, when Jesus is asked, well, what are the greatest commandments? He says, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, the first part's easy, right? Everybody love God? Easy peasy. Everybody love your neighbors yourself? I got to tell you, that's, that's a tough thing. I, I've been confessing to Patsy lately. I just, I'm, I'm in a bit of a, a funk right now where I find it almost impossible to love my neighbors myself. You know, and I'm having to repent for that every day. You know, I always wonder, why did, why did Jesus throw that out there? Because it's hard, and you can't do it unless you have the Holy Spirit with you. That kind of love he's talking about, agape, you, you can't do it of the flesh. You can only do it if you're in the Spirit of God. Did, Becky. Becky. I was just going to say, because we've always been surrounded by Christians in our neighborhood, and um, so now that's not necessarily the story, and, my, and our daughter's always welcome to the real world, and then you know, now we have a ministry. Not that everybody, but anyway, most people work. And we have some interesting new neighbors. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> With teenage sons who play rap music very loudly. Uh, although yesterday I did notice they were playing Disney tunes. So, <laughs> yeah, somebody got the message. You know, Pharaoh sees the spirit of God upon him. You know, you could see it in his character. You see it in his message. You see it in his knowledge. You see it in his wisdom. You see it in his humility. And that's a tough one. By the way, I still have copies of the book I wrote on humility. Humility and how I achieved it. Uh, so if you, <laughs> let me know if you want after class if you want one of those. But that really is true. The presence and the power of the Holy Spirit can be seen in very practical ways in our character and mostly in our humility. And back to my buddy Tom, that's one of the things that he possessed was great humility. He had a great sense of humor. He had a very attractive personality. You wanted to be around him. And yet you knew within five minutes of meeting time, he was a man of God. He would not let you leave his presence without knowing that fact. So in verse 38 says, Pharaoh recognized that Joseph was enabled by God, and therefore he gives him all this authority. He was pleased that Joseph didn't just interpret the dreams, but he also offered up a solution to the looming crisis that he's just foretold. 
And Pharaoh immediately believed his dreams were about Egypt, not himself. I think that might have been why Pharaoh was at first troubled so badly. He might have thought those dreams were about him as opposed to the land of Egypt. And so now Joseph has put that, given him the peace uh, with that interpretation. You know, great leaders and Pharaoh's uh, behavior throughout this episode, I think paints him in a very positive light. He recognized that Joseph was special. He recognized he was a man of God and he gave him all the authority with the exception, you know, no, no one higher than his own. You know, it's, it's very reminiscent of the uh, Joseph being in Potiphar's house. And he gave, said Potiphar worried about what? Nothing. Nothing, nothing except what he was going to eat. That's how good a servant that he was. And then he gives him this name, um, Bart. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to pronounce that name again because gosh knows I don't know how to pronounce it. Zaphanapanea. Hey, he's, I think his microphone broke up. I think he said Zaphanapanea. <laughs> Isn't that a crazy name? And it's only used in this one place. He never uses that name for him again. Okay. The exact meaning in ancient Egypt is, is unknown, though it undoubtedly signified something pretty grandiose. Um, one of the oldest translations of the Torah interprets that name as the man whom mysteries are revealed. And Josephus, much later, said, uh, calls that name the revealer of secrets. So this was a, a, an appropriate name as far as Pharaoh's concerned to give to Joseph. But again, it's the only place it gets used in scripture is this one time. And so while Pharaoh showered Joseph with praise and, and authority, he's just not talking. At least not in scripture. They're not documenting anything. And I think he, again, I think he's dumbfounded at what's going on. And he said he took off this signet ring and put it on Joseph's hand in verse 42. But what does a signet ring signify? Authority, power. Nothing got done. It's basically the platinum charge card of Egypt's time. It gave you the authority to do anything. Anything you said and you had the signet ring would be done. So, I mean, Pharaoh took it off his own hand and gave it to Joseph. Think about it. That's pretty heady stuff when you think about it. So he, then they, they dress him in robes, a gold necklace. They put him in a royal chariot. I just can't imagine what is going through Joseph's mind at this point. Only a few hours before, he's in prison, scruffy looking. Now he's dressed in royal garb. He's in a royal chariot. Joseph, Joseph is riding high at this point. And it says he was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh the king. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land. He's a, he was a young man with, to have so much authority. You know, think about that. Yet he'd been in God's school of deep trusting for many, many years. Bart, let's do uh, verses 47 to 49. Okay. During the seven years of abundance, the land produced plentifully. Joseph collected all the food produced in those seven years of abundance in Egypt and stored it in the cities. In each city, he put the food grown in the fields surrounding it. And Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain like the sand of the sea. It was so much that he stopped keeping records because it was beyond measure. So when you think about this, you, you have a problem that's coming. You can't just centralize this. You can't say, oh, we're going to make these big storage bins and stuff like that in the city and everybody's going to. No, he's gone out throughout the whole land of Egypt to set in motion the things that needed to be done. When we were in uh, Israel a few years ago with uh, Dan and Meg, in one location they had this, um, I don't know, it's, it's a storage pit. Basically, it stored grain in here. You can see the stairs uh, going down on the right-hand side there. Basically, they would fill up, they make these giant pits grain, for grain storage, and you'd fill it up as high as you can, and then the stairs were put there so that you could get access to it as you lowered the, the level of the grain. So I imagine, I talked to Dan over the weekend, and, and uh, he said that's probably exactly what it was like. Now, there could have been different variations of it, but this is the kind of thing that probably was uh, set up to store the grain. Bart, uh, go ahead and read verses 50 to 52. Before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Azanath, daughter of Potipharah, priest of On. 
Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh. And he said, it is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. The second son he named Ephraim. And he said, it's because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. So from his Egyptian wife, Joseph fathers Manasseh, whose name means forgetfulness. Uh, this was because God had made Joseph forget the previous pain in his life. Have you ever been there when you had your first child? Anything else that happened previously in life, you just was gone? You're, you're not even thinking about it? You hold that child in your arms? I can see why he named the child Manasseh. And then the second child comes along, Ephraim, means fruitfulness. I think it's interesting that he's got an Egyptian wife, but yet he's given Hebrew names to his children. You know, C.S. Lewis, uh, in his book, The Great Divorce, he described uh, hell as a place where no one forgets anything. Remembering every slight, every cruel exchange of words, every wrong that's been done to them, everybody is utterly unforgiving. But in heaven, all those things we put away because all things have become new. Have you ever bumped into someone who can't forget any wrong that's ever happened to them? It's a shame. I got people in my family that don't talk for decades because they can't forget things that were said 25 and 30 years ago. And they live in a kind of a personal hell here on earth because they can't do so. And so here's Joseph, I think, acknowledging I'm 30. And yeah, I've had, listen, I had evidently 16 or 17, you know, pretty good years. Dad really took care of me. And I had 13 years here. And now I'm the second most powerful man in the land. It's, it really is amazing. It really is. <clears throat> and like I said, the fact that uh, he didn't forget the faith of his fathers, he named his children with Hebrew names. Uh, Bart, let's go ahead and finish up with uh, verses 53 to 57. <clears throat> okay. The seven years of abundance in Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began, just as Joseph had said. There was famine in all the other lands, but in the whole land of Egypt there was food. When all Egypt began to feel the famine, the people cried to Pharaoh for food. And then Pharaoh told all the Egyptians, go to Joseph and do what he tells you. And when famine had spread over the whole country, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold grain to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe throughout Egypt. And all the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph, because the famine was severe everywhere. Now, my translation says, but the land of Egypt had bread. Remember we talked about in the last lesson or so that they, they really had kind of invented leavened bread was, was an Egyptian thing. So they had bread. They were able to survive you know, these, these trying times. And the other thing I noticed I thought was really interesting, it says, go to Joseph. Whatever he says to you, you shall do. Now, just a second ago, he's given him this grandiose title, the person who you know, uh, reveals secrets and everything else. And now he's just calling him Joseph. Why do you, why do you, think, he, why do you think he did that? Why wouldn't he use the grandiose name in front of the Egyptians again? Okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> I think there's a few reasons why he did it. I think Pharaoh did so out of respect to Joseph. I think he has a lot of respect for what he's done and what he's doing, and so he used his, his Hebrew name. Uh, also, I think his hedging his bets a little bit. You know, in case Joseph's policies were unpopular, the Egyptian people would blame the Hebrew, not Pharaoh. So he's leaving himself an out, if you will. And Pharaoh had gained an awful lot of respect for the God of Joseph. I think it's a sign of respect that he called him Joseph and, didn't, and not the other land, the other name. Since God has informed you of all this, there will be no one so discerning and wise as you are. So the famines in all the lands... Because of Joseph's wise preparation, Egypt has a supply, and they're opening up the storehouses. They're selling grain to people who need it. Then it says, all the countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain. The people in Canaan, including Joseph's family, are about to trek to Egypt to go buy grain from the brother that they think they killed. 